Okay, now we have Norberto. Does this thing work? Is this thing on? Yeah? Okay, sweet. Um, actually, we do have a policy, only PHP, you know? Um, you need to. Have you seen any of my talks? I'm against anything you say, basically. Yes, I don't. Uh, yes, I didn't. So, um, this talk is about Erlang because okay. I hate PHP. Okay. Okay. So, sh so, shall we allow him to talk about Erlang? Would you prefer to hear about Closure Script? <laughs> Haskell. Okay, we, we can do him harm afterwards if we don't like it. Yes, so yes, just uh, definitely. Go ahead. Okay, Give I'm a big hand for Norbert. <laughs> okay, uh, so this, I'm just going to tell you straight that this talk is about 45 minutes, maybe a little more, because I do not expect you to be able to concentrate for a longer period of time. And um, I'm going to try to cover a lot of stuff. And so I'm going to be going fast. I'm going to be jumping around. So I hope everyone has had their coffee. First, I need to know about you. How many people here have worked with a big JavaScript framework? Angular, Backbone, whatever. OK, sweet. So you've all felt the pain. And uh, how many people have done some functional programming? Anything? Sweet. Closure, perchance? Closure-ish? OK, cool. Go away. All right, so who am I? Uh, I've worked in a variety of industries, and I've worked in a variety of technology stacks, low level, high level, functional, object oriented. And so I've gained some perspective on, on certain things. And one of, these things, one of these realizations is that, first of all, I'm not a front end developer. Uh, uh, Photoshop scares me. And even though I generate a lot of JavaScript and CSS, I don't consider myself a front end developer, and I would never hire myself as a front end developer. On top of that, it turns out that I'm not a very strong back-end developer. <laughs> I, I have seen a lot of shitty code, so I know that I have a developed sense of code smell, and my, I definitely have a high squelch filter. But I have also met a lot of people that are a lot smarter than me. So what do I do? Well, it turns out that my forte is solving people, figuring out what problem people are having and solving it via software. I have a real knack for you know, drilling down to a root cause that someone's real issue is, and then proposing some kind of software solution. And the way I keep a step ahead of these people that are a lot smarter than me is I cheat. And I cheat by using better tools. And this is what this talk is about. It's about using better tools. Because we can all argue, and I'm sure we will over beers later, whether Clojure, Ruby, Haskell, Erlang, PHP is the best solution for writing backend software. But the story with ClojureScript is different, because ClojureScript and React.js um, is basically a, about 10 times better than any other solution in the front-end development right now. I mean, it, it just blows the competition out of the water. So let's start with some armchair philosophy. A Chinese philosopher once said that not having heard something is not as good as having heard it. Having heard it is not as good as having seen it. Having seen it is not as good as knowing it but knowing it is not as good as putting it into practice. I don't want you guys to understand the things I'm talking about. I want you to start putting them into practice, because these ideas are permanent and are not specific to a technology stack. So there's this really old quote about Lisp programmers knowing the cost of everything and the value of nothing. This was from a time when Lisp was still spelled as an acronym, and hardware was so slow it couldn't deal with garbage collection. So not very relevant these days. But it turns out this is relevant. Most, actually all programmers, know the cost of everything, the value of nothing. We, cons we basically ne we don't question the systems we use enough. All we do is we hack around them and prop them up and make them work a little better. Sometimes we just need to question the system, take a step back, and look for maybe another way. How many people have read Steve Viege's uh, blog post about kingdom of nouns? Kingdom of nouns. No? Okay, Stevie Eggers, really? Okay, you guys need to read this. You're Ruby programmers. It's a Java blog post, but it's, it's, it's important. Okay, so he talks about kingdom nouns being the wrong thing. You need to move to the kingdom of verbs. Uh, go read it. It's, I'm not going to talk about it. But the thing is, he was sort of right, but he was wrong. Because the actual solution is not verbs, it's data. And when I mean data, I mean things like numbers, strings, keywords maps, vectors, and sets. Three scalars, three collections. This is all you ever need to model all of the data in your application. 
And this basically, in a nutshell, is what Clojure is. It's not a functional programming language. It's a way of talking about your program just using these basic data structures and composing them in very interesting ways. So let's talk about web applications. Web applications are scaling in complexity at an exponential scale. In the beginning, there was jQuery, and it was beautiful because we finally could build software without worrying about what browser we're in. And with this new technology, we were able to build bigger and better and faster things. And because of that, we ended up with jQuery soup. And at that point, we had to take a step back because the solution was not scaling. So we took a step back, and we invented MVStar. MVStar let us build bigger and bigger and bigger things. And now we have MVStar soup. And nothing has changed. I have seen some of, these, some, I have seen some of this stuff, and they are monstrosities. I have this feeling we're sort of suffering from Stockholm Syndrome. We're this frog in a pot that's boiling to death, but the water temperature is rising so slowly, we don't notice it until it's way, way too late. So I'm here, I'm going to propose to you a different architecture for front-end development. And it's, all it is is rendering in events. Because when you start thinking about it, those things are axioms. You need to have a way to render, otherwise the application doesn't make sense. And you need a way to handle events, because everything in the browser is about events. So I posit to you that this is actually all you ever need as far as architecture is concerned. Our first superhero today is React.js. Who here has heard of React.js? OK, sweet. Now, I need you to forget everything you know about React.js. <laughs> so if, for people who don't know, uh, React.js is Facebook's uh, library for you know, their solution for how to build uh, web, web skill software. Uh, the thing is, I want you to forget everything you know about Relay, Flux, GraphQL, React.js, and so forth. We're going to do none of that. What we're going to do is we're going to treat React.js as a black box. Just like V8 is an optimized JavaScript engine for your browser, React.js is your new optimized rendering engine for your browser. That's all you need to know about it. In order to have a conversation with you, we need to have set up some mental models so we're all on the same page. The first mental model I want you to understand is this one. React.js developers were inspired by video game developers. And the way video games work is that there's a critical loop that renders the game at 60 frames per second. This is the most important loop in the game, because if it doesn't render 60 frames per second, you'll notice and you'll make very bad comments on YouTube. During the time when the computer is not rendering 60 frames per second and has a couple spare cycles, it gives it away to the application and says, here, go do some work. This is how you're going to start building web applications. The browser renders at 60 FPS. Your application, whenever it's allowed to, does some work. And you never talk to the browser, and the browser never talks to you. That's what React.js is for. Second, uh, second mental model I need you to picture is that everything flows downstream. Or if you're American, there's a, more, there's a nastier version of that same quote. The idea is that there's a data model, and then you have some code. And your code transforms that data model into a different data model. And that's the virtual DOM. And then the virtual DOM takes over, and the React.js takes over, and renders that virtual DOM into your browser. A more concrete example would be, for example, this. You have a tweet, so you have a vector with a hash. And then you have some code that transforms it into a different kind of data structure, which looks like HTML. And then React.js takes over and figures out what that HTML should look like in your browser. When you get new data, you add, a, for example, a second tweet to your vector. The code generates a brand new HTML page. Because remember, you know nothing about the browser. So as far as you're concerned, you're generating a brand new page. And this is where the power of React.js comes in. React.js knows what the browser thinks it has, and it knows what you want. And it has a very optimized diffing algorithm to figure out the best way to batch update the browser. This is the same concept in pictorial form. We're going to come back to it later. So you have code, and then you have a virtual browser, and then you have HTML, and you have the actual browser. Let me check how I'm doing with time. Oh, I'm doing pretty awesome with time. OK. So our next superhero is ClojureScript. When people talk about programming languages, I get this picture of Star Wars, in the sense Rebel Alliance versus the Evil Empire. You know, Ruby versus Java, or more likely right now, Elixir versus Ruby. 
And this is why I know that closure is onto something, because when I think of closure, I never, think, I never get this picture in my head. When I think of closure, I think of the Borg. Because closure, as a community and as a programming language, is, is very unique. Their approach is basically they go into every community, every language, every library, and they steal all the good ideas. They literally assimilate them. Closure, yes, it's a lisp. But it's all these other things as well. It's an STM, it has polymorphism. Yes, it has things like REPLs and functional programming. But notice all the way on the bottom, it has things like transducers, core async, which is, goes, which is go, core logic, which is prolog, and core types, which is Haskell. Right? These guys, they basically assimilate any good ideas. But what does this have to do with ClojureScript? Well, it turns out ClojureScript is exactly all of those same things. It just happens that it runs on the JavaScript instead of on the JVM. So I want that to sink in for a minute. Think about your JavaScript or your CoffeeScript or your TypeScript, whatever. Do they give you these kind of semantics? Because these are not just syntax changes. It's not a transpiler. It gives you completely new superpowers. If people ask me why closure, and I only have one sentence, I would say it's this. If nothing else, closure is optimized to manage risk in your complexity of your project. So if this is something that you feel strongly about, then you should definitely consider closure. There must be a catch. There must be a catch. Uh, there's, it's just too good to be true. I'm sure it's ridiculously difficult to actually do things in language, like in Haskell, right? Let's talk about a whole world application. But first, I need to talk about the elephant in the room. Yes, closure is a lisp. That means it has parentheses. <laughs> we, we're not going to get around that. But if the one thing stopping you from actually trying closure is the parentheses, then I'm not even going to try to persuade you. Remember? Smarter people, smarter problems. In practice, actually, the, every Lisp winning will tell you that it doesn't matter what editor you have, there's a plugin for actually handling the parentheses for you. So it's a complete non-issue. But let's say you're more courageous. This is Vrotsov RB, after all. So you actually want to learn closure. But in order to understand the slides, you actually need to le learn closure. So I am now going to teach you closure in 30 seconds. This is a comment. This is a function call, a function with arguments. This is how you define a function with an argument. This is a, here I'm defining a var, that's a hash, with keys as keywords, and a string, a vector, and a set. This is some syntax, uh, some syntax, it's just functions. It's just for fetching things out of a hash or setting new values inside of a hash. And this is an example of a little syntax sugar, which is deconstructing inside of a function. Now you know closure. Seriously, that's all there is to it. <laughs> but except for understanding the actual syntax, you need an environment. And this is where boot comes in. So for all of you Ruby developers, boot is rbenv plus rake plus gem file plus bundler, all wrapped into one with a little hint of capistrano. It's basically, it sets up your closure, it sets up what version of closure and closure script you should be running. It figures out all of the dependencies. It loads everything. It gives you access to the REPLs. And then through normal function composition, it gives you a way to define custom tasks like you would in Rake. Now, there's a huge asterisk next to that because there's also line. And line happens to be, at the moment, the de facto standard in the closure community. It does all of those exact same things. It just has a very different internal implementation. The reason I'm talking about boot in this presentation is because, first of all, the configuration will fit on a slide. And the second reason is, if you have not already drank the Clojure Kool-Aid, then I feel that boot right now has a better story for someone that wants to get started with Clojure Script and doesn't really want to deal with the JVM so much. Similarly, we need a wrapper for React.js because we don't want to deal with React.js specifically. It has way too much of an object-oriented API. So ROM is what I'm going to be talking about this presentation, but again, huge asterisk. Ohm and Reagent are much more mature libraries as far as wrappers go for React.js. Um, especially if you're just going to get started, I'd really suggest Reagent. As the, th just go with Reagent. 
And the reason why I'm talking about ROM is, first of all, I really like the semantics it offers. And the second reason is because of the semantics, it can emulate all those other libraries. So that's why I'm going to use that for my presentation. So in order to get a production-ready closure script application into production, you need four files. You need an HTML file, a CSS file, which is totally optional, closure script file, and that build.boot. Right? So anybody who's built Rails new or built a Backbone or Angular or whatever application, seriously, this is all you need. Simplicity. Remember my lightning talk? This is the HTML file. Notice that it has absolutely no mentions of closure script or even dev, um, uh, development and production environments. This is the HTML that will work in production and boot injects things that you need for development, you know, convenience. This is your hello world closure script application. Notice there's a namespace, which, you know, if nothing else, just having namespaces in JavaScript, this is already enough for me to switch over. This has an <laughs> in a namespace hello.core, it loads a library, rum, and then it defines a post, which is just some data. And it defines a component, and then all the way on the bottom, it mounts that component onto that specific part in the, in the HTML that we said we were going to do it. Um, rum def C is a macro, uh, and basically what it does is it takes that body and creates a React.js component class, like a proper one. You can use it outside of ClojureScript, right? Nobody will, know, no, nobody will be the wiser. So basically, we create this component called render post that just returns a block quote text with an author. This is build.boot. All it really is is a couple libraries that I'm interested in, a bunch of development helper tools, and then all the way on the bottom here, these, these tools provide these tasks. And those tasks can either be run from the command line, or since they're functions, you can just run them in the REPL or wherever. So since they're functions, you can compose them. So for example, you can build yourself something like a dev task, dev, which, first of all, watch will watch your files for any changes. HTML, CSS, JavaScript. Serve will run an HTTP server, so it'll actually run your server, so you don't need to run a separate one. Remember, we're talking about building a closure, closure script application. We, had, we don't want anything to do with closure here. And then it'll set up a REPL for you. This REPL will actually connect to the browser. I know, science fiction. And then from CLJS, JS is the de facto way of loading third-party JavaScript libraries in a very sensible way. CLJS is the actual compiler of your, uh, of your closure script. And then reload will do that thing that I mentioned, that basically when any of these things will change via WebSockets, it'll upload the changes and only change those things that have changed. So this is a more refined version of that hot reload swapping we saw in yesterday's lightning talk for React.js. So if you, you know, bear with me here, basically in five minutes, we generated a development environment that's already better than anything you have. <laughs> On top of everything else that it does, it in includes auto-reloading via WebSockets. That doesn't break your state of the application. And it includes a real browser into a REPL into your browser. Notice that closure script here, when I tell it to add a number to a string, it, it, it tells me it's a bad idea, but it'll do it anyway, because it's JavaScript. And if I run alert hello, it'll actually pop up in my browser. This is not even a REPL into like a Node.js or something. This is a REPL into the running browser session in my tab. OK, so we built a hello world app. But I'm here selling you that this is a way to build huge, complex applications. Remember that applications consist of rendering and events. So let's talk about rendering. This is that thing we had, and we saw that this is our entire application, basically. This is all we have to do. We have to figure out a way to get data that makes sense to us and a way to transform it into the DOM that we want, our, that our designers will be happy with. So rendering is a data model, a data transformation, and no step three. Because as soon as you transform the data into a virtual DOM, React just takes over and only, in a very optimal way, batch updates the things that needs to change in the browser. But we can do better than this. Because a lot of the times, if nothing has changed in our data model, and we know that it means that nothing will change in the browser, we can actually tell, we, we can actually just do no work. 
So React.js won't even have to do a diffing algorithm it, because it won't even run. So this part of the talk is to consider, let's talk about different semantics we can provide in an application for talking about what it means for things to render on change. So RUM has this really great concept of mixins. And mixins are, are a way to define custom semantics for what it means for your components to change. Because you as the application developer know best. Because it's specific to your application. So a really simple one is RUM static. Closure script gives you immutable data structures. Persistent, if you're from the Haskell community. Which means that every time you change a hash or update a vector or whatever, it doesn't update it. It returns a new value. It returns a new version, and the old version stays the same. And if this sounds like crazy talk, it's actually very performant because once a, once a programming language can guarantee that it, you, think you can't change things, it can actually share a lot of the state. So it's actually very, very performant. It's actually much better than copying a lot of times. So here's a component label that we define as a static with a static mixin. And the way it works is it's a, static means that you're telling me that the only way that something in this thing might change is if the arguments are different. So if I run label hello twice with the same argument, it won't, run, it won't even run the rendering function, the transformation the second time, because it knows that there's no reason for it. And because we're talking about mutual data structures, this is even faster than if we did it in with React.js native. Because in JavaScript, you have to do a string comparison. And here, you do a pointer comparison. Rum Reactive is a different kind of mixin. And this actually models reagent. So if you're using reagent, this is, this is the approach you're using basically everywhere. So in order to understand it, we need to talk about atoms. So atom, Clojure gives you different concurrency models about how to think about concurrency in your, in your application. And atoms just happen to be one of them. They're a way to share independent, mutable, synchronous, uh, synchronize basically immutable shared data. And so they give you things like ability to uh, do atomic updates that things can read and write at the same time, but you're, you're guaranteed that the update is atomic. And it gives you other things, like, for example, ability to set up watchers. So you basically say, anytime someone changes this atom, I want to be informed about it. So basically, you can use this knowledge building your components. You can, for example, define a to-do atom, which is some data. And you define a component item that says that it's reactive and it's going to react on some state. So this state is the span title rum react state. And then you mount it at some point in your application. And then anytime someone changes this data, this component automatically knows that it needs to update itself. There's no orchestration involved. It's automagic. It's the same. It's, the effect is similar to two-way binding in Angular or Knockout.js with none of the performance issues. And it's always a one-way flow. So another really common trick for atoms is Sometimes you're talking about mix, you're talking about different components in React that need to share some state, but it's not a real global state. It's just something that a couple of components need to share. This is an ideal example where normally we just use an atom to say that these couple things need to share some data, so we're going to let them. And it's really it's like it's like local global state. <laughs> and anytime uh, the input changes, it's going to reset the value of the atom, and then when the search button wants to use it, it always knows it's up to date. So rum cursor is ohm. So if you want to use ohm, you basically use cursors. Um, I don't think I'm going to go into the code for cursors, because I don't think it's the best approach a lot of the times. You can read more about it. Uh, but I think one thing that is really no, one thing we need to talk about in ohm is that, well, first of all, ohm was the first real React.js wrapper for ClojureScript that really made it into the big scene, into the, you know, outside of ClojureScript. And the reason why it made a, a huge wave was because some of the consequences of having a one-way flow and having a st uh, all of your state in the beginning influencing your actual page had very interesting side effects. For example, it's very easy to do infinite undo in an application. Because when something changes, all you do is you save that old version of the atom somewhere, like on a stack. And when someone wants to do an undo, you just pop it off the stack. And basically, you get infinite undo for free. And because of immutable data structures, it doesn't take up a lot of memory. Another thing you can do is, we were talking about event streaming. People who use ohm and cursors, basically, very often they can model their application as a set of events. 
And this has very nice consequences because except for uh, working inside the browser very well, you can send those events to the back end, right? So you basically get event streaming for free. Another really cool trick for development and other issues is since your entire application is a consequence of this data structure in the beginning, you can serialize this data and do interesting things with it. For example, you can save it to local storage, and next time someone opens up the page, it basically gets that same view. Or for example, you can send it over the wire, and in a different, completely in a different browser, you can open up and see the application exactly like that user saw it, with all of the state. So this is cursors. Uh, cursors solve this problem of um, if you do have this entire application in one place, sometimes components have to fetch very, uh, various parts of data. And cursors try to solve this problem by basically being these pointers of indirection. I don't think this is a super great idea in, in the large scale, but that's the thing about RUM. Because RUM is, RUM is this concept of we don't know what you want, so we're just going to let you do whatever you want. You can actually mix and match these in an application. So some parts will use reactive, some parts will use cursors, some, some, a lot of them will use static because they're just dependent on the arguments. And so you can mix and match this stuff uh, as you wish, which is nice because in Omen Reagent, it sort of pushes on you what kind of storage mechanism and syncing mechanism you need to use. And the other nice attribute of this is that you can actually build your own. Rum Data Script is a great example of this. Uh, who here knows about data log? All right, we got some people up there. <laughs> so data log is a query language. So it's like SQL, but different. <laughs> I'm not going to go really into it. Um, one of the things, one of the nice things about it is, um, for one, of, one of the reasons why it's really popular now is because Datomic uses it as its query language. But um, it has some nice properties about uh, graph traversal and so forth. Uh, DataScript is a port of this data log concept uh, to the front end. <laughs> the guy actually ported the entire query language, and you can have a in-memory database in your browser, and build our views as queries on this data. So a lot of times, we, I got this question about how Gra and Facebook used to do stuff where they had one data storage and then they split it into a bunch of stores and then they did stuff, but then they realized that this creates complexity and they don't know what to do with it. So now they're sort of moving away from it and they have just this one data store and they have this thing called GraphQL. Well, this is sort of similar but different. <laughs> you have a data store and then you can build queries and, you're, and so it's always up to date and you can model very complex situations easily, just the same way as imagine if you didn't have SQL, if you had to do it in imperative code. So why in the world would you want to do that? Well, here's an ideal CRUD application. This is GitHub Rails issues, right? And this is, it's, it's not specific to GitHub. This is how a lot of our applications look like. You have a list of things, and then you have a million things you can sort and group by. And often these, the way this stuff works is, for example, you, set a you s select a specific milestone, which has a side effect that the author dropdown should change because now it should only show the authors that are actually relevant to that milestone. And the way the, this usually works and the way the GitHub does this is that every time you click on something, it sends an AJAX query to the server with a humongous list of params. And there's, an end, there's a Rails endpoint on the other end that sort of understands all of these front-end things and has to sort of figure out how to do things, and then it returns a list of stuff. Which is silly, because even something like Rails, which is huge, has about, it's definitely under 10K issues. If you just took all of this text and all of the things you can sort of sort and group by and just sent it over the wires, one big package, we're talking about kilobytes of code, 100 kilo, 100K, even if it was a half a meg. That's like one big JPEG, right? You could just send it over once, and then you have real-time UI. And if you think this is science fiction, here's an actual implementation of it. There's something called Acha Acha that's CO. And what the guy does, this is the, the, the idea is that this is sort of like a GitHub achievements kind of thing. And the way it works is the first time you load this page, it loads, if you open up the console, it, it'll change over time. But right now, I think it was like around one megabyte of data. It literally loads up one megabyte of data into your, into your browser. And then all of the pages, whether it's like a profile page or a repo page or the dashboard, it's all, cust it's all basically done at runtime via queries. And the beautiful thing about uh, data log and data, and data script is that data log has this beautiful um, 
property that it's reversible. So when you have a component, and you said that this component renders using this query, the way which Acha Acha works is that one, the, it fetches all the data at first, but then it opens up a WebSocket to the server. So when new data comes into the server, the server will inform your browser via WebSockets that here we have some new data. And then when your browser gets this data, it needs to re-render the page, right? Because you got new data. So what do you re-render? Well, the naive approach is you just rerun all of the queries. But because data log is reversible, you can actually ask each single component, if given this new data, I re-ran you, would your, would your result change? And if he says yes, then I say, OK, here, here's the new thing. Rerun your stuff. So this is, yet again, a different crazy idea about rendering on change. Once your abstraction is that we don't know because it's application specific, you can provide your own semantics. Right? So let's talk about events, because that's this other, other half of this coin, right? So we've got this application. And if you haven't figured it out yet, I want to point this out. Once I've built this thing that basically says, given some data, this is how I want the web page to look like, you're done. In the sense that no matter what, I, how I decide things change inside the data, I never have to touch this code ever again. I can unit test all this, all this stuff, and I know that whatever new techniques I come up with for fetching and changing data, I never have to change this bit of code. Because this bit of code said, given this data, this is how the web page should look like. Right? So let's talk about what happens before data. Well, before data, you have a bunch of events. And so you have AJAX and WebSockets and user input and browser events and, and JS events and probably a million other things. So you have a bunch of stuff happening, but you want simplicity. You want a simple way to say, there's only one way to generate my data. So what do you do? Well, this is where another superhero comes in called Core Async. What is Core Async? Core Async is basically stealing Go's CSP and putting it into Clojure. And the beautiful thing about this, by the way, as a sort of a side comment, is um, they, they did this without actually changing a single line in the compiler. This is a library. They, include, they wrote this as a library that changes the, entirely the semantics of your language. This is the power of Lisp that people keep talking about, but Clojure is really the first to deliver on this promise. So what, what, what is this core async stuff? Well, how many people have done something with CSP? <laughs> All right. So let's, let's say we want to, you know, I, I want to start up an infinite loop. That first line starts up an infinite loop that every 250 milliseconds yields a value. And then after I start that infinite loop, I want to start in a second infinite loop and a third infinite loop. And a fourth infinite loop that sort of figures out, uh, fetches the data that I've been generating and does something, you know, pretty with the HTML. Can someone tell me how this works in JavaScript where there are no threads? The way this works is Go is a macro. It's a very ugly macro. There'll be dragons inside. But the thing is, you as a, as a user don't need to know that. And the way Go works is it actually takes this code and rewrites it. It figures out what stuff is asynchronous and rewrites it into callbacks. If you're on the JVM, if you're on Clojure, you can decide whether you want to use threads or green threads. But in JavaScript, you need to use callbacks because there are no threads. So basically, you can write code that looks synchronous, but it actually behaves asynchronously. You've completely hidden all that callback hell complexity and you're sort of flushing out the real logic of your application. Why would you want to do this? Well, <laughs> when you have a hammer, everything is a what? A nail, right? Well, once you start using core async, everything in your application is a queue. You use a queue everywhere. If you're not sure what to do, just add another queue. This is an example. Imagine you have this crazy requirement that a user gives you some input, and you need to do a query, but you want to query a web API, an image API, a video API. But you're only interested in the first result. So you need to make three AJAX calls, 
and all of them are going to return at some point, but you're only interested in which one's fastest. On top of that, because you really care about speed, you're going to store that information in local storage. And next time somebody does that same exact query, I want you to just fetch the local storage version. And on top of this, because we care about speed so much, if you can't deal with this in one second, I just want you to give up. Now, imagine those requirements in JavaScript. All of those callbacks that are dependent on each other, because it's not enough to have an on success. You need to have an on success before someone else has an on success. This is, this is not pseudocode. This is exactly how you do this enclosure. You basically create yourself a channel, and then you create yourself a second channel. T, timeout is a, is a function that basically returns a channel that says that after one second in this case, I'm going to put a value onto this channel for you. And then you create these go loops, and you say, and each of these things is going to run a query, and whenever it returns, it's going to put it onto this channel. And that thing on the bottom, the alt, basically says, given these lists of channels, I'm only interested in the first value that comes from any of them. And I want to block until that returns. Because notice that all these goes, the only reason they work is they don't block. They start running code in the background, and you know, they're, they're non-blocking. Isn't this amazing? You guys are not as happy about this as you should be. Who here is speechless? So I guess, you know, if we move up in architecture, right, we haven't changed what core async does. But in truth, what it also does is it just basically creates a new way of architecture. Because I seriously, I just have a channel everywhere. Every time we're talking, you know, like I was talking about how we, decom we decomplect by splitting things into separate components. Well, the thing is, those components need to communicate with each other. And for example, how you do it in Scala with Akka or with Erlang, with actor model, is that something has to talk to something, uh, send a message to something else. And this is a problem. This is better than other systems. But the problem is that this thing needs to know who to send the message to. It needs to know the mailbox. What we do is we introduce a third concept. Be between this component and this component, we introduce a channel. And basically, the channel can have its own semantics. It can be blocking, non-blocking. It can be buffered, non-buffered. It can be broadcasting, multiplexing, whatever. It doesn't matter. From the component's perspective, my input and my output is a channel. I do some work when I get the data I need. And when I'm finishing doing my work, I put it on a channel. And I have no idea where this information came from. And I have no idea where this information is going. That's the job of someone who's orchestrating me. This is what I meant by decomplecting. These components really no longer know anything about each other. And they can be reused for lots of different things. Last time I talked about this, someone asked, what about promises? Well, I hope I've maybe sort of, I'm trying to show you that Aquarius Async is more than just a nicer way to avoid callback hell. It basically gives you a brand new mini language to talk about how to build systems, right? This channel and this idea that these channels can have their own semantics means that this is more than just promises. So basically, that's our application. That's, that's how we solve that problem of having lots of various things talking asynchronously. Core async and how you use it figures out how to make all those things work in synchronous. Now for something completely different. I wasn't sure how long this talk was going to take. I'm actually pretty happy with the time. So this is a bunch of stuff I didn't mention, but you should definitely check out. Uh, I can sort of run through them very quickly. Transducers are basically a, a science fiction version of enumerable. <laughs> I can explain it over beers later. <laughs> Core logic is an implementation of prolog. Core match is pattern matching like real pattern matching, right? React Native, so in the future, we are all going to be using ClojureScript for or doing our iOS development as well. If you want to do, Clo if you're courageous enough to do Clojure in the back end and ClojureScript on the front end, definitely check out Sente, because it removes basically all of the boilerplate code of your, your back end talking to your front end. It basically figures out how to do Ajax connections and all this stuff. It can upgrade itself to a WebSocket. It can automatically downgrade itself. It, it basically handles all this stuff for you. Transit. If you're doing closure of code and you need to parse JSON or serialize JSON, do not use the default JSON parser. Use Transit. 
Transit is a library that uses your browser's C JSON library. It's super, super fast. Leaven, Leaven is an implementation, a different implementation of something that Stuart Serial did that's called components. You can, uh, basically, Stuart Serial has a blog post about components, and he talks about how to build even bigger systems when it's not enough to separate into core async. You want, like, a huge subsystem, and then you want a second subsystem, and we're, like, the systems I'm talking about now are like at the service, like the microservice and the macroservice level. We actually have people, for example, at Prismatic who can declaratively define their entire infrastructure using one big closure map. And so all of the dependencies between services and so forth are actually defined declaratively. And then things like components, Sierra components can actually start up and shut down entire batches of services and dependencies between each other. So if you're interested in you know, architecture on a macro scale, definitely check out Stuart Sierra's components. Uh, prismatic schema and closure type. If anyone tells me that closure does not ha ha have types and I will not use it because of that, just go ahead and use it. <laughs> uh, closure type is, um, is based on Racket, Racket's type system, if anyone has seen that. And prismatic schema is a very different idea of how to write uh, software that you know, sort of has constraint checking involved. More, a more dynamic kind of version of it. Um, and there's a couple other things. Simple versus easy. I sort of talked about this yesterday, but I didn't mention there's a very good talk uh, by Rich Hickey called Simple Made Easy. I think he gave two versions, one at StrangeLoop and one he actually gave a RubyConf. So if that's not you know, credit, I don't know what is. Um, there's also two very good talks about transducers. One of them is very specific to implementation of transducers, and the other one is a more high level of why and how to use them. Definitely check them out because they're mind-blowing concepts. And the last thing is, you have this concept of incidental versus inherent complexity. And this is, I, I wish I had for not forgotten to put this on my slide yesterday because these are two more words that everyone needs to start using. We need to start differentiating between complexity that's concrete to our domain because we have a very complex domain and incidental complexity, which is the result not of our domain, but the way we've built our systems. It's basically a pain that we're causing ourselves. I think that's pretty much it. Now, I have a, so, <laughs> I should probably backtrack a little bit. Um, it turns out that a lot of people are excited about closure script, but they don't know how to get started. And I keep hearing about this, so I've started working on some course material for basically, taking your hand and walking you step by step and pulling you into this insane vortex that you will never leave. And um, I, have this, I have this idea for something basically like a closure script from, hero, from zero to hero. And I don't, you know, in the true spirit of Amy Hoy's just fucking ship it, I don't have a landing page up yet. But if you go to this link, there's a MailChimp sign up. So if you're interested in actually figuring out how to, you know, start doing this in your own, uh, please sign up, and I will definitely be mailing you stuff. Are there any questions? Dude, there's silence. No, I, I have stopped. <laughs> so you said that in uh, Core Async on JVM, you can choose whether to use green threads or a real thread threads. yes so does that mean that when eventually browser uh, environment gets thread support then you get thread support in core async for free in closure script yes in theory if if web if the way the web workers change they they give you more uh, application code can use the web workers a lot more there is a possibility for that and just to, just to highlight that it's not magic. If you want to use real threads versus green threads, you use different methods, right? Closure is all about simplicity. So it, if you have different semantics, because those things provide different semantics, you have to be explicit that here I want to use green threads, here I want to use real threads. But yeah, the, the, the real problem right now is that we have these things called web workers, but you can't really use them sensibly from application code right now. One more yes or no question. The answer must be yes or no, because otherwise he'll go on for half an hour. I love you too. So can you share code because share code between Clojure backend and Clojure script on frontend in well, any way? What a wonderful question. Yes or no? 
The short answer is, first of all, often you don't, of, very often you don't share code because you're only sharing data, and data is the most important. But there is something called CLJX, which means that 98% of the code you use is the same on ClojureScript on Clojure and Clojure. So as long as you don't call methods that are specific to the runtime, you can include them in a file and with the ending CLJX, and then you can use the compiler, and the compiler will either generate JVM or JavaScript code. Super question. Yes or no question? Closure, yes. PHP, no. Wrong answer. Maybe. <laughs> Thank you very much. A big applause. <laughs>